Hello and welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast Pressurized, a short, punchy version of our full-length shows. So if you want to get right to the scientific point, this is the place to be. If you really enjoy the topic and you think, I'd like to know more, just match the episode number and you'll be able to find the full-length episode in our feed. And now, to get right to the point. So anyway, in terms of sort of mythological made-up characters influencing what we think about the deep sea, that might be a subject we could talk about on the podcast. Well, we've constantly tried to push back against the, the deep sea monster, the stuff lurking down there kind of thing. It'd be great to actually not just poo-poo that, but like address it, actually see what these stories are based on, whether any of them hold water. I'm here with Tyler Greenfield, a student of paleontology and someone with a passionate interest in cryptozoology. How are you doing, Tyler? Doing pretty good. How about you? I'm not bad. Thanks so much for coming on. And I've got to admit, I was totally sucked into the blog once I discovered it as well. And I actually realized we'd crossed paths organically on Twitter before we were sort of introduced with this idea. So I'm guilty of perpetuating a myth. I used to say that we only know about Megalodon from teeth because of the cartilaginous skeleton. And I'm not sure if it was a tweet directly from from you or a tweet from someone else just saying you know stop saying this and then a link to your blog post about it and so i totally held my hands up and like yes new information this is brilliant what one of the angles i try and push and i think the philosophy you should have as a scientist is there's nothing better than being wrong because that means that there's a whole new thing to learn your preconceptions are off and you've got a new area to sort of discover can you talk us through that uh, megalodon of course is enjoying a bit of fame right now because of all those highly accurate films <laughs> yeah so there is a very common misconception that not only megalodon but extinct sharks in general that we only know about them from their teeth. You'll see this kind of claim brought up all the time, whether it's in books, movies, even documentaries. They repeat this talking point all the time that we don't know much about extinct sharks because we only have their teeth. And as someone who really likes sharks and studies them a lot, this is just an absurd claim. We have many, many species of extinct sharks that we have body fossils of. We have their skeletons. We have their soft tissues, their skin, their scales, their fins. Some are 100% complete. And Megalodon is no exception. We don't have any soft tissues from Megalodon, but we do have skeletal remains. We have vertebrae. We also do have some isolated scales. And then we have from close relatives, not Megalodon itself, but from close relatives, we do have the remains of the jaws, actually, not just the teeth. So we do actually know a great deal about what Megalodon would have looked like from these skeletal remains. We think it would have been pretty similar to what a great white looked like, although way bigger and probably bulkier. So it's it's very wrong to say that we don't know what it looked like because we do have a lot of good evidence, including that skeletal evidence. Oh, and another part we do have that's possibly from Megalodon, but may also be from a relative, is actually the cartilage from the end of the nose. And it shows us that it probably had a very robust blunt snout. They actually went misidentified for a long time. It was thought they belonged to poor beagle sharks, which are still alive today. So if you can imagine a poor beagle or a salmon shark, same genus. That's pretty much what a megalodon, his face would have looked like, although much, much larger. And so our, our sort of estimates of the size, that's fairly confident now. Yes. So back in the days before the skeletal material was really studied, talking like a hundred years ago, there were some insane estimates for megalodon size. We're talking between 80 and 120 feet long, which is massive. That's bigger than a blue whale at its biggest. And that's not the case. We don't think that anymore. Based on refined methods of estimating size from the teeth and from the vertebra, we think between 50 and 60 feet is more likely. Although there may be bigger individuals that would be in like the 65 foot range. We're not 100% certain because there still are some flaws with the methodology. We don't have a complete skeleton. We just have partial remains. So there still is a little bit of uncertainty. We can be fairly confident that it wasn't a hundred or more feet long. Do you find that the old estimates, because they're more exciting, tend to be the ones that end up maybe in more popular culture or end up getting cited for a little extra excitement? Because whenever we see like a colossal and giant squid talked about in the media, they show them next to like a London bus and things like <laughs> that. And it, it's this old estimate where the animal was much, much bigger. They favor that one because it looks more exciting. Like we've got a pretty good idea. We've got a lot of specimens now of both of those. And we've got a better idea of the size but it's still plenty big yeah you are spot on the bigger estimates are all over in popular culture even though they've been known to be false for 50 or more years you'll still see whether it be the fake documentaries that discovery channel put out or the meg the recent movie or any sort of 
books, uh, a lot of cryptozoology stuff too, will say that Megalodon was between 80 and 120 feet long because that attracts people. That's it's a very romantic idea of what this shark would have been like. It was, of course, nowhere near that big, but it sells, you know. Yeah, and you can still cite a publication which adds validity to it. You can still cite a scientist who was like, oh, I've only got this piece and sort of guessing it might be around here. But then you can still say it's peer-reviewed literature, but you've selectively chosen the out-of-date yes. <laughs> piece of information. One of the older estimates of in sort of that 80 to 100 foot range comes from a reconstruction of the Jaws that was completed in 1908 or 1909 at the American Museum of Natural History. And they, they calculated that absurd length from this reconstructed jaw. But the problem is they reconstructed the teeth completely wrong. They used just the very front anterior teeth and they put it throughout the entire jaw. So throughout the entire jaw, all the teeth are huge and are the, roughly the same size. So it just it led to this completely overblown estimate. And yet you still see people cite that as if it's reliable. It's a matter of kind of resolution. The error bars have got smaller. We've homed in on what's true as we've got more information and better techniques. No one was really wrong. We just got better and better and better until it, it became this narrow point of far more likelihood. But yeah, you can always pick that extreme error bar and get excited about that. Yeah, because back then, of course, they didn't have any, any computers. They couldn't do all the analyses that we can do today. The shark with the sort of whirl of teeth? Yes, helicoprion. And all the different reconstructions of that? Yeah, there were a lot over the years, dozens and dozens. <laughs> all that could possibly be. And completely wrong, all of them. Well, that's what I want to ask. I don't know where to begin to find what the current understanding is away from all of the fun with where can we put the spiral of teeth? Yeah, so currently we think the spiral was in the lower jaw. And we know this because we actually have skull material from Helicoprion now. It was locked in a big block of rock and they had to CT scan it. So beforehand, they sort of just had to guess what it looked like. But now with the technology, we can really figure out how the skull was arranged and how the teeth fit into the lower jaw. So we can be pretty certain that the world fit in the lower jaw now. Now, of course, before CT scanning and before they even discovered that skull, it was just the world. And some people weren't even sure if, it, if they were teeth or not. So there are some reconstructions that have them as fin spines, sort of curling off the dorsal <laughs> fin or curling off the tail fin. Some of them have them on the upper jaw. Some of them have one or more worlds, even though we know they only now had one. It's pretty much any variation you can imagine. It probably functioned as sort of a saw and they would rub up against the upper teeth in the upper jaw and sort of cut prey in half. We think it probably ate cephalopods and small fishes, so it would get them in the mouth, get them in between the whirl and the teeth in the upper jaw, and then slice them in between. You touched on the Discovery Channel mockumentaries. Oh and boy. this wasn't <laughs> initially in my in my notes, but then you you said like a trigger word and my knuckles went pale. <laughs> the one that crosses our path a lot is the mermaids one. I think you're probably on the same level as me. I found that the most damaging and irresponsible act by a supposedly educational channel that I could imagine, because it was deliberately misleading. It wasn't a what if fun. It wasn't, you know, War of the Worlds, stop panicking, folks. It's all, it's all just a play. It was very deliberately misleading. The disclaimer was very, very small. People were acting as real scientists and real authority. They had their fun, they got their ratings, but it's us who still now, years later, are getting the emails and the conspiracy theories and uh, you're lying about what's down there, you're hiding it from us. No matter how much I try and tell people about the deep sea and what's going on and what we know and what we don't know and try and push back against that, that was just, I'm staggered by it. It was so, so irresponsible. I feel exactly the same way. Damaging and irresponsible are the two perfect words that I would also use to describe them. I mean, the Megalodon one single-handedly revived the idea that Megalodon is still out there. Beforehand, the interest had kind of died off, but as soon as those documentaries, not really documentaries, fake documentaries, came out, it skyrocketed. And now people get asked about it all the time. Scientists continually get questions about, is Megalodon still out there? The answer is, of course, no. But a lot of people don't like to hear that answer. Yeah, because it was entertainment, because it was fun. It's even worse that they doubled down. They put out the first one in 2013, and then they made a follow-up in 2014 and tried to reiterate that this was all real. And we're still dealing with the fallout, and we're still having 
noise in the signal, basically, created by this thing. You know, I'm trying to get this podcast out there and I'm doing YouTube and all sorts of other stuff. And it's, yeah, it's a quagmire now of this deliberate misinformation for fun. And you can you can do that. You can do a what if. You can do a like, oh, maybe it is, and, and have a bit of a ghost hunters and play around with it. But don't put on the mask of science. Don't get actors to pretend to be scientists from respected institutions that then lie to people. I can't dress up as a police officer and pull people over. I can't put on military uniform and try and get discounts people are outraged at that and rightly so so don't pretend to be someone who's an expert and then just flood the system with noise yeah i couldn't i couldn't agree more discovery channel continues to put out fake documentaries i mean most of the ones they've put out at shark week the past few years even though they're not related to megalodon they've been completely faked about giant hammerheads or giant great whites and they're not real they're just completely made up stories that are being promoted as a real product and that's probably even more damaging because that seems a bit more believable and more real but it's not it's completely fake i think i wanted to ask you about is you are you are really even-handed how you look into your sort of cryptid work. You're not totally a debunker. You get the primary sources and you look at the sort of likelihood of things. And when we first had a chat, you said something really interesting that sounded really familiar. It was it was like what we had with the with the deepest fish. There were all these reports of snailfish in the Hadal trenches at sort of seven, eight thousand meters, going right back to the 1950s. But there was a few reports of much, much deeper fish, but singular reports, they drowned out what was building in the evidence, what was building as like no, this is consistent. This probably is is a real thing. Are you seeing sort of more charismatic, more extreme cryptids drowning out what might actually be real species that have gone unnoticed? Yes, see it all the time. Like things like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot or the Yeti have already become so ingrained in pop culture that there's really no way to fight against them and then get the more obscure but more believable possible unknown species out there because you're just fighting in an endless tide of more, I guess, more interesting to the public romantic more sexy even cryptids and monsters they definitely do overtake the more reliable accounts the more believable accounts those get pushed to the wayside while the more extraordinary and more unbelievable stories are the ones that you hear about all the time of, of all the extinct sharks why is it the biggest one we know exactly about? exactly my <laughs> it's point it's because the most exciting one and and i i guarantee like the colossal squid if they found a bigger one then it's maybe that survived <laughs> yes yeah you don't hear about any obscure shark species supposedly coming back from the dead. There's no Helicoprion sightings. There's no Helicoprion Discovery Channel fake documentary. And it's so distinctive. And it's very distinctive. <laughs> if somebody were to say an account about it, there'd be a lot of people that would believe it because it's it's a more obscure and very, very distinctive looking animal. Do you have like a top three? Do you have like a, a, a list of cryptids you think are really, really quite likely based on your primary research? Unfortunately, my list is very small and I don't even know if I'd have a top. <laughs> that probably means it's accurate. A top <laughs> three. I really just have a top one set of cryptids. So you, you might be familiar with William Beebe and his bathysphere. Very, very famous marine explorer and event in the history of, of deep sea exploration. What many people don't know is that during some of these dives in the early 30s is that he saw up to five species of fish that were at the time unknown and have not been seen since his dives. And the, these would be the ones that I'd put in the top spot. So one of them was a giant dragon fish. Fish. He called it the untouchable bathysphere fish. He even gave it a scientific name, Bathysphera intacta. And it was supposedly six feet long. Now, I don't really think it was that long. I think he was probably misestimating. I mean, he was looking through a small porthole with only a little spotlight shining at it and no way to tell distance. But the features it has, the certain bioluminescent spots that it has on the body and certain colors are different from any other dragonfish. And it seems believable enough to me that it could have been a real unknown species. But unfortunately, it hasn't been seen since or caught since. Now, there were other fish that he cited too. They're not quite as interesting, and I'm a bit unsure of their validity. One is one he called the five-lined constellation fish. And according to him, it looks sort of like a butterfly fish or an angel fish, sort of a shallow water reef fish, except it had five rows of bioluminescent spots on it. This one I'm really unsure about because it sounds to me like a shallow water fish in a place that it doesn't belong. And then there's even the idea that it may have been a misidentified comb jelly, which seems more likely to me. Another one he cited was an angler fish, except that it had three lures 
on its head instead of one. They sort of branched off. This one also seems semi-believable to me. But again, it would have been pretty small, very dark colored. I am also skeptical of that one. There were two others he cited, a possible new species of whalefish. One of the oddest ones is one that he called the abyssal rainbow gar. It doesn't really look like a gar. It looks more like a snipe eel, but I guess BB thought it looked like a gar. It was supposedly divided into three different colors. One part of it was red, one part of it was yellow, and the other part of it was blue. This one I'm very, very skeptical of. Maybe iridescence, reflection from his spotlight on the bathysphere, being different colors. I'm a bit worried about his nitrogen mix. That too. <laughs> Possible <laughs> hallucinations. His co-pilot, Otis Barton, apparently did not see any of these fish. When he wrote his account in a different book later after BB, he said that he never saw any of these five unknown species. Now, that could be because he didn't actually see them or because he had a falling out with BB and didn't want to give him any sort of credit. So I'm also unsure of, of Otis Barton's testimony. The other possibility is they are now known and described, but a trawled up specimen in, a, in an ethanol jar is very different from his, his quite emotional response at the time of read some of his bits and he's very very excited yes. and, and these <laughs> names unfortunately as charismatic as they are they don't do his credibility a great deal of favor because they're so you know it's the it's the jaguar shark the fantastical beast that he's seeing i know bb's got a, a book that's pretty good yes it's called the half mile down from 1934 and this that contains the accounts of the, his five unknown species uh he did not have photographs of them they could not really take quality photographs in the bathosphere at that time he did have drawings made of all these fishes by his artist elsie bostelman was her name and she was a very very talented painter she produced these striking paintings not only of his unknown species but any of the species he encountered during his bathysphere dives and they're on a star black background and then it's the fish front and center really really striking images i'm really the first of their kind previously deep sea fish hadn't really been portrayed this way usually they were portrayed in lit environments and they were drawn from dead specimens of course because that's all they had that at the time they did propel his unknown species into pop culture you can find a lot of older books and book covers you know illustrations that have his unknown species in them because elsie bosselman's drawings were so convincing that people thought they were known from better material than just anecdotal accounts that leads on quite nicely actually uh, paleo art memes and the sort of how an artist's reconstruction can then influence and, and radiate i do a little bit of taxonomic illustration as well and because of having a little bit of an art background i have to fight with draw what's really there even if it looks goofy even yes, if it yes. makes a bad picture and i'm fighting the aesthetic side of myself and the sort of more artistic side to this would look so much nicer if that was a little bit thicker and that wasn't there and it's it's no you've got to absolutely draw what was there and if it looks cross-eyed and angry and goofy unfortunately that's just how the fish looks yep <laughs> I'm wondering if, certainly with the paleontology reconstructions and maybe even edging into the cryptids, there's a little bit of poetic license with making it that cool image, the one that's going to be repeated in Pop's eye and, and sort of get more media attention. And then that style influences others and it sort of radiates out. It's not even that original mistake or that original exaggeration that then becomes known of these animals. It happens all the time in paleo art. And a lot of people would like to think that it doesn't happen anymore. There are a lot of paleo artists who think that we've gone past the point of having paleo art memes, but we certainly have not because somebody is always going to make a reconstruction that while not the most accurate and containing errors is very attractive and people want to copy it endlessly and post it endlessly. And that just perpetuates the meme further and further. And I think science art in general, we tend to gravitate towards the extraordinary or the monstrous even, and not towards the realistic or naturalistic. I have written quite a few posts about counteracting paleo art memes. They're especially bad for fish and for cephalopods from the fossil record. And that's what I've dedicated most of my time to counteracting. Mainly cartilaginous fishes, sharks and rays. And then I, I really like cephalopods as well. And they are by far the most poorly represented in, in paleo art. Most reconstructions, I just look at and have to groan a little bit because they're completely off the mark from what we know from the published literature, from the fossil from any reliable sources of information we have. And then those illustrations are then essentially part of the primary literature. People start with that image to then look at this related species and like, oh, well, mine's a little bit longer and a little bit wider here. And they almost morph that original interpretation. And so, yeah, it's a meme. It becomes fixed that this thing looked like this. Yeah, and that's how they did it in the early days. 
getting back to the primary material and the fossils themselves. Reading your blog, I learned a great deal. When removing a mineralized matrix from around the bones themselves and deciding what is preserved skin and a preserved imprint and what is just decay and mineralization around the bone and needs to be cleared off, do you think our old preconceptions about prehistoric animals, you know, dinosaurs being scaly, do you think maybe 50 years ago a lot of feathers were cleaned off specimens assumed to just be mud? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there was a case of this almost happening. A little theropod predatory dinosaur uh, called Ornithomimus, found in Canada in the early 1900s, and they had prepped away most of the matrix, but there were these curious dark little stains on the upper arm that were sort of line-shaped, and they went across the upper arm. And for a long time, they had no idea what they were. Fortunately, they did not remove them. Well, then they use modern technology to chemically analyze them, and it turns out they're carbonized feather traces. So I can imagine that many other dinosaurs may have had faint, faint traces of feathers that were completely removed. And skin is even worse. A lot of times they knew the skin was there, but they would remove it because they wanted to mount the skeletons. And you can't mount a skeleton if it's got a huge block of rock on top of it. The first dinosaur mummy ever discovered, um, in Montosaurus, which is one of the duck dinosaurs, uh, it was found in 1882, I think, in South Dakota. And they knew it had skin on it, but they removed most of the skin to get to the bones. According to the field workers, originally, it was almost entirely covered in skin. And because that was the, that was the methodology, like with, with CT scanning now, we can be shocked at that. But that, that was essentially how they got the material to work with. That was part of the process. You make a little note of what's there and then you get to the skeleton. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine the things that have been lost because of less careful techniques, you know, 100 years ago. We've probably lost a, a lot of soft tissue information, not just for dinosaurs, but for any other animal from the fossil record. Yeah, I feel like a lot of science is, is trying to remove as much of yourself as possible and see things as they really are. So with your sort of crypto work, why do we choose to ignore the evidence when it's fun? The big ones that keep coming back up, Globsters, which like I used to really love these books when I was a kid. So that's why I've like internalized a lot of these things. And I'm, I'm realizing now, looking back, that they cut out the bits that would spoil the fun. You know, mm -hmm. that it was always like, and scientists took a tissue sample and it's like, and then what? This is an account from the 1950s. Like this book was published in 97. Where are they? <laughs> <laughs> it led to the theories of the giant octopus, basically. It was a big gelatinous mass for heavy decomposed, a couple were trawled up, a couple washed up, and they really were enormous. And there's a couple of nice papers I'll link to in the description of this episode of that very genetic analysis that revealed that it would they tended to be sperm whales, didn't they? They tended to be the, the sort of melon and head structure from a sperm whale. Yeah, the giant octopus uh, that supposedly washed up in Florida in the 1890s was the one that turned out to be whale blubber. A lot of other globsters have turned out to be whales, and then a lot of other ones have turned out to be basking sharks. Basking sharks are a uh, sort of be, have become an infamous culprit for globsters and then pretty much any globster you see you can bet that it's either a whale or a basking shark and you know scientists baffled or you know if it's a really good piece boffins baffled <laughs> i always love that when you're called a boffin you know which side they're on and then in the text in the actual text is how quickly a marine biologist turned up and told them what it was the headline in the image of what carries through is basically decomposition certain animals decomposing really mess with our brains so have you seen how basking sharks really really become a plesiosaur yes. very quickly it's amazing how deceptively they can look like a, a plesiosaur or some sort of <laughs> prehistoric marine reptile just a little bit of decomposition the jaws fall off some of the fins fall off you've got a plesiosaur but yeah basically if you can visualize it a basking shark that huge open filter feeding mouth that's not very structurally strong so that's one of the first places to decompose and they've got a so tiny little skull <laughs> at the end of a yeah. pretty long vertebral column and that turns into a neck and a head erase out that massive filter feeding jaw it's a it's nessie it's a plesiosaur yeah there, there's a, a very famous case of this happening with a basking shark in 1977 i think a japanese trawler pulled one up from off the coast of new zealand the zuyo maru I'm, I'm terrible at pronunciation but that was the name of the ship and it, of course all the news articles and cryptozoology books and even creationist literature, even to this day, still claim that it was a plesiosaur. But if you know basking shark anatomy, and you've actually read the papers that were published 
about the anatomy and about even the chemistry of this specimen that clearly show that it was a basking shark. It comes up against entertainment. And that it's fascinating. I, I hadn't thought about young earth and creationist viewpoint. It frequently overlaps with cryptozoology. It's become more noticeable in, in recent decades. Cryptozoology, when it began at the middle of the century, I mean, there were some pretty serious names attached. Cryptozoological papers were published in Nature, and, and there were plenty of scientists who took it seriously. But as those older scientists have died and the community has shifted a lot away from the more scientific angle and more towards the young earth creationist angle or even the paranormal or extraterrestrial. And I'm not saying that it was great to begin with, but it has only gotten worse as time has gone on. How do you actually define cryptozoology? I'm having a bit of a moment here as I'm realizing I was talking to you about I've taken photos of animals that I know are unique, but we don't have a specimen, so I can't describe it. And I'm realizing how familiar that sounds. <laughs> it, it sounds like it, like a Bigfoot story, but it's completely different because one is a huge creation of pop culture that has been claimed to be cited for years, yet no definitive evidence has ever been put forward. And the other is, is a small fish that, I mean, not very many people would know or care about. So, you know, obviously that's more believable, but when it boils down to the basic facts, they're very similar. It's certainly not made me rich and famous. <laughs> no, not as rich and famous as as running the Bigfoot or Loch Ness Monster circuits will make you. Cryptozoology as a whole, oftentimes it is perceived as a pseudoscience. And oftentimes in practice, it is a pseudoscience. But I don't think it is inherently a pseudoscience. I'm in very small company in that opinion, but I can come at it from a paleontological and, and biological angle. There are some things of value to be studied here. And also, too, from a historical and, and sociological angle, it's worth writing down the history of this field, even if it isn't exactly accurate or true. On that point, it is very hard to define exactly what cryptozoology is. The textbook definition is just the study of unknown animals. But that's not... Which is what I do. That's that's very <laughs> basic. And it doesn't distinguish between like what you do. What you're doing is is very scientific. What they're doing is is not <laughs> at all. And yet they would be lumped under cryptozoology if we're using a very broad definition. I would like to have cryptozoology be known as a more serious study, whether that's actual unknown species or just the history of what people used to think in this field and looking through the literature and compiling bibliographies. I don't think that what a lot of cryptozoology has become today should really be considered cryptozoology. Some people have proposed sort of an informal term for that. They call it para-cryptozoology. I think that's a bit of a mouthful. So I think we do need to narrow our definitions a little bit. I think maybe at its core, being ready to be wrong and trying to remove yourself and see what's really there. I think that's maybe what separates the two. It's being ready to kill your darlings. Yes. Hesitant to jump to conclusions right away. Not being so quick to say it's, it's Bigfoot, it's the Loch Ness Monster. As much as mainstream scientists would not like what I do, those kind of cryptozoologists would hate what I do even more. Because a lot of what <laughs> I do is showing, is stepping back for a moment and saying, you know what, that's actually not a really good account to be using as a source. And I've come across them occasionally, and they're not the nicest a lot of times. Tyler, thank you so much for talking with me. I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this. Oh yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. And that was a pressurized version of one of our longer episodes. If you enjoyed that and you would like to hear the full length episode, just match the episode numbers and you'll be able to find the full length version in the feed. Thanks for listening. We'll deep see you next time and I hope to see you already. Yeah.